Um, so as Bobby said, my name is Kanani Makaimoku, and I'm an attorney at Sterling & Tucker. You may have heard of our law firm. We are an estate planning law firm here in Honolulu. And um, just by way of background, we do have about five attorneys right now who service clients. And we do probates, although we hope to avoid probate at all costs, which is why we set up a trust and an estate plan. We also handle guardianships, conservatorships, we prepare wills and trusts. So that's primarily what we do. We are happy to present at Kupuna Wiki and other seminars like this because this is something we do quite often. We do have public seminars that we offer every month and we vary the topic and we vary the location. So I do want to start by giving you some background about who we are. So you already heard about me. Um, I'm an attorney and I practice here in Honolulu. I also service clients in Hilo. We do have a neighbor island reach, so usually on a weekly basis I fly to Hilo and meet with our clients there, conduct seminars, and we want to be sure we're covering all bases. We do have another attorney who flies to Maui and services clients there as well. And we do have clients on other islands who tend to prefer to just fly over to Oahu to deal with us. So that's who we are. Now I want to give you some background about the law firm itself. So Sterling and Tucker, most people who have heard of the firm don't realize that it is woman founded. So both Judy Sterling and Michelle Tucker, our two founders, are women. Judy, as we call her, she's now retired. She actually had a series of health complications. She suffered a series of strokes unexpectedly. And um, she realized that was a wake up call and it was time for her to perhaps slow down and enjoy life and enjoy retirement. So that's what she's doing. Of course, this is her baby, this law firm, and so we see her a lot. She still comes into the office, checks in on us, checks in with the clients because it makes her happy to continue to be in contact with the people who we work with. Now, Judy and Michelle, and this is Michelle, they met as classmates at the University of Hawaii Law School. Both of them, prior to going to law school, were already CPAs, so that's their background. They had a lot of tax knowledge, they became CPAs, and sent, or they became attorneys, and then Michelle Tucker, since 2006, has been a certified financial planner. So she operates a separate business called 3D Wealth Management that is also housed in the same office as our law firm. So we've got these various components, and she prefers to handle mainly the financial planning aspect of her business at this point, but she occasionally will meet with her estate planning clients as well. Now our law firm, just to give you a, a snapshot, you can find us in a lot of different places, but I would direct your attention primarily to our main website, which is sterlingandtucker.com, and you'll find more about us, more about the seminars we conduct, who we are, and um, the services that we provide. And we also have hawaiielderlaw.com. That's another website that features links, useful information, articles about estate planning, tax planning, etc. And we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube as well. <coughs> now, hopefully, I can get through this smoothly because this is a um, <coughs> somewhat condensed version of the seminar that I would usually conduct. So I hope not to trip over things. But what I want to start by saying is most people who do not have an estate plan, the main reason they cite as to why they don't have one is procrastination. We understand that. Most people feel it's important, they're gonna get around to setting up their trust, but they feel they have a little more time, and sometimes they don't, but at least you folks are here, you're getting information, and most likely, because you're here, you probably already have an estate plan. You probably have that, um, those documents in place for yourself. Now, the other issue that we hear, or hurdle, is a lack of knowledge. And it may be that you actually know a lot about estate <coughs> planning, maybe you read a lot, you talk to your friends and neighbors, you have attended various seminars, so you feel like you know a lot of things, but you realize there's a lot of conflicting information out there, so hopefully I'll clear some of that up for you today. Now this is our agenda. Although this trust seminar today is geared towards people who have a trust and is geared towards explaining maybe the defects in trust if you haven't looked at your documents in a while, I will start with an overview of what a, a trust is, basic living trust issues, and then we'll talk about the reasons why living trusts may fail, and the importance of a trust review. So estate planning is our overall topic, and we need to understand what is an estate. So your estate is everything you own. It's your house, it's your cars, it's your cash in the bank. It's also your retirement plans. You may have IRAs, 401ks, pensions, annuities, stock savings, life insurance. Maybe these are policies you've purchased, policies that have been purchased for you. 
they are also a part of your estate. And then those other things that you own, your tangible personal property, your electronics, your jewelry, your family heirlooms, whether or not they have any monetary value, they may have a lot of sentimental value, so they are also a part of your estate. Now, do most of you in this room already have a revocable living trust? Yeah, I see a, a few nods, okay. So maybe we're a little split here. Some do and some don't. So you're still in the right place, no matter your situation. But for those of you who already have a trust, I just wanna tell you that it was a good idea to set it up. Number one reason why is because you're able to control whom you want to receive your <coughs> estate upon your death. And it's not simply a matter of I know exactly who it's gonna be and that's how it's gonna go, you have to write it down. Because if you don't write it down in the form of an estate plan and a trust, then your estate is gonna end up going through the probate process. And that's a court proceeding where a judge is gonna make a decision about who will receive your assets. And that takes the control away from you and the ability to designate who will receive assets. And that could mean that your assets end up with that sister you haven't spoken to in many years or the brother whose wife you don't really care for. So if you don't want that to happen, you really have to write it down, have a formal estate plan. You also need an estate plan, or if you have one, it was a good idea to have one because you're able to control when your beneficiaries will inherit. It's not simply a matter of when I die, that's when they'll get it. There's other factors you wanna consider. You may have young children or grandchildren, and if you go ahead and just leave a chunk of money to them, well, they're not in a position where they can really maturely resp and responsibly handle those funds. So we want to do special planning for these younger beneficiaries. We also know that about 10% of families have a special needs or disabled family member. We want to do special planning for them as well because we don't want to just give them some money and compromise any benefits they may be receiving, such as Medicaid or other governmental benefits. So there's a way to do it where we can still benefit them, but we do it in a proper way where we have a, a special needs or supplemental needs trust set up for them. And we know that some families have that family member or several family members whom we love and care about as much as everyone else, but they don't make the best decisions. And we're pretty sure if we just give them unrestricted access to the funds, they'll do things that we wouldn't agree with. And maybe we wanna kind of control that a little bit. Now, you also want your estate to be handled by the person of your choosing. So most people don't think so far as to know that when they're gone, someone is still gonna have to be here, someone trustworthy to handle everything. Even if you have a will or you have a trust, someone's still have, gonna have to pay off those final bills, gather the accounts and the assets, and then distribute assets to beneficiaries. And you probably know exactly who the best person for that job will be, but if you don't write it down, no one's gonna know that. And so you do have to have it all put on paper. And at the end, you wanna avoid costs. Nobody wants to pay more than they absolutely have to. And if you do not have a proper estate plan, you'll see that you end up paying a lot in attorney's fees, court fees, going in taxes, and had you set up a proper estate plan, much of this pie chart here would be green and you'd be giving assets to your family members. And you also specifically wanna avoid the cost in what we call a living probate, death probate, and death taxes. I'm not really gonna get into all of these items in detail today, so I'll just say that a living probate is also known as a guardianship or conservatorship. That's something that's done when an individual is alive but incapacitated, deemed by a doctor to no longer be competent to handle their own affairs. If they do not have any paperwork that names someone trustworthy to handle their assets and their affairs for them, they find that they have to go to court for a living probate or guardianship so that the court can appoint someone to legally handle their affairs. Um, and death probate is the process of transferring assets over upon death if you do not have a trust and your assets are of a level that you should have a trust, then you'll end up in court. And we also, of course, don't wanna pay death taxes if we can avoid them. We wanna pay the bare minimum. Now, we know there are a lot of living trust plans that are well done, but over time, they become outdated or they just don't work for you. And one reason why is maybe they're poorly drafted at the outset. They didn't really cover all bases. They didn't craft it to your situation. It's improperly maintained. You haven't looked at it in 25 years. So you know for certain that it's not exactly up to date or it just may have bare bones features. It's not crafted to your unique situation. So I'll talk about what features a good estate plan should have.
So I just want to introduce you to this family here. We're going to kind of use them to better understand the problems that could arise in a trust. And Bill and Mary are a married couple of over 30 years. They both are retired. And they went ahead and they got all their assets and affairs in order after their retirement. And the first thing they did was they set up a trust. So they now have a revocable living trust, a will, all the related documents that was recommended um, to them. And they also have these two children. And so the far right there is their son, John. And John is what we would consider to be the black sheep of the family. So he never really cared for school. He dropped out of school, just hangs out with his friends at the beach, drinking and doing drugs. And that's his life. Now his parents are not so happy with his choices. They want him to turn things around, but they love him just as much as their other child, and they do want to provide for him in some way. Now, Susan is their younger child. She's her brother's complete opposite. She studied very hard in school. She became a CPA, and she now operates her own CPA firm. So that's our family dynamic, and we're going to use them to illustrate some of the, the issues that may arise. So Bill and Mary, when they set up this trust, the first step they took was to transfer assets into the trust. So this is a very important step that is often overlooked by people. And the key here is that you do have to put your home, any real estate that you own into your trust. You have a new deed prepared to do that. You also need to transfer over cash assets, your bank accounts, your stocks, your bonds, mutual funds, brokerage accounts. Anything that does not have a beneficiary attached should be in your trust. There are three titles or positions when it comes to a, a trust. There are what we call the trustors, trustees, and beneficiaries. If you already have a trust, you may have what's called a settlor designated in your trust. Maybe not a trustor, but the trustor, settlor, grantor, those all refer to the same thing, and that's the owner and creator of the trust. You also have the trustees, so they manage the assets in the trust, and the beneficiaries, of course, get to use whatever is in there. So it's technically the same as before. You'll see if you set up a trust, you remain in control. There's no change in your property taxes. So if you've got that homeowner's exemption, that owner-occupant exemption, when you convey your home to your trust, you're going to keep that same exemption. There's no change in your income tax filing. You just do your same income tax filing as before, and you report everything on that document and no new tax forms. So you don't have to worry about having to do anything difficult or adjust to new um, forms or circumstances. <clears throat> so you may be wondering, well, if that's the case, why would I create a living trust? Well, we like to think of it as an important standby device. It's going to kick in in the event of your incapacity, definitely in the event of your death, and it's going to prevent your estate from ending up in court and be able to protect your family members and make sure that everything goes to them. Now, the living trust, the main reason you would set one up is to avoid probate, to avoid going to court and go through that proceeding. But along with it, with the death probate, comes a lot of hassle. First of all, there are fees. The court itself will, pay, will have you pay fees um, to file documents, to do certain things along the way. You also have to publish in the newspaper. So you folks have probably seen those fine print court notices in the paper and very often they are referring to the estate of some individual and they are for probates and that's because we have to give notice to creditors in a probate proceeding and we would prefer not to do that and open up all the doors but you don't have a choice when you have a probate involved there are also executor fees the court will appoint someone to handle the estate and that person's going to get paid for the job that they do and on top of that the probate attorney is going to get paid and sometimes that's a percentage of the estate Sometimes it's a reasonableness standard that's used, and they'll just work so many hours on the file, apply their hourly rate to the number of hours, and that's what they get paid. So it can be a lot of money. Now, additionally, probate is a hassle because it takes a long time, on average one to two years in, on this island, um, but we've seen much longer than that. Uh, we also know that it's public. You know, Anyone can show up to probate court and listen in on what's going on every day. And you also see the published notices, so you can't really hide the details of your estate. And additionally, if you've got assets in other states, you own real estate in other states, you are going to be facing multiple probates. So those homes, those properties will have to be probated in the jurisdictions in which they're located. So we want to avoid that. Now there's also the issue of the federal estate tax. So this is 
synonymous with the death tax that I mentioned earlier. So the federal estate tax is actually a threshold at which your estate will be taxed upon your death, depending on the value of your assets. And this has changed drastically. So as you can see right now, it's $11.2 million. So what that means, to break it down, is if you have less than $11.2 million when you die in 2018, you don't have to pay any tax to the federal government. Pretty straightforward. But in the mid-90s to early 2000s, this number was actually 600000 to 650000 So it has drastically changed, and um, we don't know what the future holds. Back in 2011, Congress was meeting to discuss the fiscal cliff, and what they were deciding is if they were going to lower the estate tax exemption to $1 million. And they got very close to doing so, but instead they set it at $5 million and they adjusted it annually at the rate of inflation. And they also said at that time that it was a permanent change. But we knew it was permanent until they changed their minds again. So fast forward to December 2017 when they met again and the Republican tax plan passed. And what that essentially said is that it would double the estate tax exemption. So in 2018, we were projected to be at 5.6 million. We doubled that, now we're at 11.2. However, this is not gonna be around forever. It will sunset according to the rules of that particular bill, and it's gonna end in the year 2025. So another seven years at this $11 million rate, adjusted annually for inflation, then it's supposed to go back to five million, which still for most of us is not really an issue for our states and won't impact us. But we do wanna be aware of what this really means and the fact that we do have to keep an eye on the estate tax exemption. Now this is a federal exemption. Hawaii traditionally has tracked the federal level. So in other words, if you had a federal estate tax due, you also were taxed at the state level because every state has its own rules about state estate tax. Now we were unclear at the beginning of the year, probably until about mid-year, as to what Hawaii's estate tax level is. And we understand it now that it is actually 5.49 million. It remained at last year's exemption. And so potentially there are individuals who could die in the year 2018 who would have a taxable estate as far as the state of Hawaii is concerned, but not a taxable estate as far as the federal level is concerned. So just something to be aware of. So now that I did the overview of the trust, I am gonna move into the top 10 defects that we see. So I'm gonna read each of these items, but I'm also gonna break them down for you one by one. So improper funding, no protection from nursing home costs, no protection for untrustworthy heirs, no creditor or divorce protection if that's needed for beneficiaries. No asset protection if you've got disabled or special needs family members. No ability to create incentives for heirs. No ability to stretch IRA distributions. Vague or missing trust provisions, we see those quite a lot. And no built-in flexibility to adjust to changing circumstances. So I'll start with number one. I don't have to spend too much time on it because I touched on it earlier when I said funding is very important. When you set up your trust, it's not a matter of, I'm relieved, I can go home, and many of our clients, it's funny, will sign their trust and they'll say, now I can get hit by a car and it'll be okay. <laughs> and I'll say, no, not so fast, and I sure hope that doesn't happen. But at the same time, there is some work to be done. Once you set up the trust, you do have to go to the bank, transfer those accounts over to your trust, make sure that your home is retitled to your trust. So we can't overlook this step because the trust is only gonna control what's in it. And so if you don't put anything in there, you could still be in a position where a probate is needed, even if you had a trust. Now defect number two is no nursing home protection. So Today's seminar doesn't touch too much on the issue of Medicaid or nursing home costs, but what we know currently is that about 60% of people in the state of Hawaii do not need long-term care or skilled nursing care, but about 40% do. Now this number is likely to flip in the other direction because we've got a rapidly aging population. A lot more people will need nursing home care. And we know that it's quite expensive. Now this is as reported um, by Genworth in 2017, so a skilled nursing facility single occupancy room um, is about $158,000 per year currently. And um, I'm not the best mathematician, but I think that's about 13,000 a month, give or take. So it's a lot of money, and if you have a spouse and your spouse is also in this position, 
then we really have a lot to think about is, you know, are you able to afford to pay for this over the years? And so what most people do is they'll pay out of pocket because they have no other choice, or if they have long-term care insurance, they'll dip into that first and use those benefits, of course. But at some point, if both spouses are in a position where they need nursing home care, they will exhaust the funds. And the option at that point that you would want to have available to you is Medicaid. Now Medicaid, not to be confused with Medicare, is a welfare program. It's a needs-based needs program that pays for nursing home care. So we know it's different from care because Medicare ends in care and this ends in aid. And that indicates need. And so what it's important to know is that if you have a trust, you want to have language in your trust that addresses Medicaid should you need it. And we call those Medicaid triggers. So getting back to our story, I introduce you to the family. And Bill and Mary were going along in life, enjoying their retirement, traveling, having fun. And suddenly, Bill suffered a stroke. And so out of nowhere, he finds himself unable to handle his finances anymore. He's got some vision problems. He cannot sign his name anymore. He's now in a position where he's essentially disabled. And so he's going to need someone to step in and do things for him. Now, thankfully, he has a trust. And in the trust, it indicates that if either spouse finds himself in this position, the other spouse is the remaining trustee. And she, his wife, will be able to handle things for him. So that's good, because his stroke has now prevented him from doing anything. He doesn't really have the capacity anymore to make decisions, fill out paperwork, do things on his behalf. However, his wife does. And because their trust has Medicaid triggers, Mary can actually reposition their assets. In other words, she can move assets over to her individual name and get them out of his name in order to get him qualified. Now, I'm really simplifying the process here because there's a lot more to it. But the key is that there needs to be language, first of all, to allow someone to be able to do these things on behalf of the individual who's in a position to apply for Medicaid. And it's not typical that you can just move assets over to someone else and qualify. However, there are certain rules that apply when you have a spouse. And that's because Medicaid does not want to impoverish both spouses, because then we're setting the other spouse up for needing care in the future and not having the funds to pay for it. So they will allow Mary to receive some of those assets and hold them separate from her husband and then get him qualified. So we mention this because a lot of older trusts do not address the issue of Medicaid. And so if you have a trust, you should have it reviewed to make sure that those issues are addressed. Now, defect number three is no protection for untrustworthy heirs. So I shared a little bit about the kids and their situation. Now for Susan, what Bill and Mary probably are going to do in their trust is say, when we die, Susan's 50% goes outright to her. Outright and free of trust, no restriction. She can do what she wants. We trust her. However, that other 50%, we're going to put it in a trust, a separate sub-trust for John. And what that means is that John is not the um, controller of that money. He's not the manager. And so Susan is probably going to be the trustee for her brother's trust. She's going to be the gatekeeper. So she'll give him the income that's earned off the assets in his trust. Uh, but he'll have to go through her to ask for access to the principal, the rest of the funds. And he would have to demonstrate that those requests are reasonable, not take a bunch of money out to go buy a Lamborghini or something like that. The money would be used for, for his needs or for other reasonable requests. So this is a way of protecting the money and controlling it so that this individual who is not so trustworthy cannot burn through those funds right away. Now, alternatively, it could be that John's got creditor issues. And maybe he's got a lot of debt, he's been involved in lawsuits, there are judgments that exist against him, but he has no assets on paper. And so nothing can be collected. Well, Bill and Mary, if they're aware of that, they don't want to foot the bill either. They worked hard for all the money that they earned, and they want to leave him 50%, but they don't want it to be subject to these claims. They can create a separate creditor protection subtrust for John, and the funds would be managed by a third party. Now the key here is John is not the owner of these funds. He's the beneficiary, but he's not the owner and he's not the manager. So third parties cannot reach in and attach a lien to this trust. They also cannot compel the trustee to make a distribution. It's up to her. She has full discretion, his sister, to be able to release those funds. And in the end, all of this money is protected. And if he's never safe, to transfer money to, then the funds are going to go to someone else in the end. There'll be a, a backup beneficiary named by his parents. 
There also could be an issue of divorce protection. So maybe John's issue is not that he's got creditors, but he uh, doesn't pick the best partners in life, and he's been through multiple divorces. Now, if he receives those funds that he inherited from his parents, and let's say it's something like $700,000, and he goes ahead and puts that money into a joint bank account, he's now commingled that money from a legal standpoint. And in the event of a divorce, his spouse is going to claim half of that money. And of course, that's not what Bill and Mary would have wanted. They do not want to pay for any of that, and they want that to stay within their family line. And so what could have been done instead, and this is something many of our clients favor, is they could have created a divorce protection trust. And so this is a sub-trust that will hold money, John's share, and he is the trustee of his own trust. So this is different from the other trusts I showed you because with a divorce protection trust, the beneficiary is also the trustee. And so they will keep the money separate. They can open a bank account under this subtrust, put those funds in there. But in the event of a divorce, they'll show that they inherited the money, it went to the separate pot, they are the only ones with access, the only ones spending the money with control, and therefore it should not be split in the event of a divorce. So it's a nice feature to have just in case, even if the marriage is just fine. Now, defect number six is no protection for disabled heirs. So Bill and Mary, they don't have any disabled heirs from a technical perspective as far as them being on government benefits or um, having any disabilities. However, if they did, they could have set up a special needs trust. This is also known as a supplemental needs trust. And the idea of this is that the funds that are inherited would go into this special pot and a third party trustee would manage the funds for this beneficiary. Um, individual is already on Medicaid or other government benefits, they're not going to be disqualified from those benefits because this money will not show up as an asset of theirs. They are a beneficiary of the money, they can get some distributions as needed, and the money's there to enhance their lives, to um, pay for their enjoyment, their clothing, their other things that they may need in life, but it's not going to be showing up as an asset when they reapply for benefits, and therefore it will not compromise their benefits. Now traditionally, if you were to just leave money to an individual in this position, they will get disqualified from Medicaid, they will have to spend down all that money quickly, and they will have to reapply. And in the meantime, there's going to be a waiting period, they're not going to have medical coverage, it's going to be a big problem. So if we know of someone who already has this situation, we want to set it up properly for them at the outset. Now defect number seven is no incentives for heirs. So, Perhaps John was starting to turn his life around and Bill and Mary saw that he was really trying and therefore they wanted to encourage that behavior. And they decided that instead of restricting him so tightly in his subtrust, they're instead going to give him some incentives, some conditions that they'll set up and he has to meet those conditions in order to get any distributions from the trust. So it can be really anything that you want. Maybe they said that they want him to go back to school, get a part-time job, take random drug tests and test negative every time, whatever it may be, and they can set those up. We have had clients who have set their incentive trusts up for their kids in a way where their kids' distributions every year will match their W-2 form. So in other words, the more money they earn at their job, the more money they can pull from the trust. Now, we can't all sustain that, but I guess those clients have children who don't care to work at all. And so they feel like they're not going to foot the bill. If their kids will work, then the kids can get some money. If they don't work, they don't get any money. But you can set it up however you see fit. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about IRA stretch provisions. And I'm not a CPA, so I try my best to explain this structure in this situation I'm talking about. So what we're talking about is a tax deferred account, maybe a traditional IRA, a 401k, an annuity, if you have something like that. And for most people who have a retirement account, what you do when you open that account is you name beneficiary. So you fill out the beneficiary designation form, usually name your spouse first and your kids, etc. But for some people, what they decide to do when they have a trust is they name their trust as the beneficiary. They're not able to change the ownership of these accounts because they're individual retirement accounts. They need to be owned by an individual. But for whatever reason, they go, they fill out the form, and they change the beneficiary to the trust. Now, what we want you to be aware of if you've done that is you probably should change that back to a human beneficiary. But if you want to leave it in that 
designation for a particular reason, you do have to make sure that your trust accounts for that situation. And what I'm talking about is that the trust has what we call special look-through provisions, and that will allow the named beneficiaries of your trust to be deemed the beneficiaries of your retirement. The reason that's important is because people have life expectancies. Trusts do not. And when the IRA or the IRS, excuse me, is looking at the measurable life in making distributions from an IRA account, they're going to need a person's lifespan to look at. And so if you do not have these kinds of provisions in your trust and you've named your trust as the beneficiary of an IRA, it is going to be a big burden, a big hassle, and a complicated situation to resolve upon your death. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. If Mary had a $100,000 IRA and she named her two kids as beneficiaries and she did not have the, pro or I'm sorry, she named her trust as beneficiary and the two kids being the beneficiaries of the trust and she did not have those special look through provisions in her trust, what the IRS is going to require is that all of those funds be distributed from her IRA within five years of her death. What that does is it accelerates the payment of taxes and so they're taking out a larger amount every year and in the end the kids get about 82000 So not terrible but not great either. Now what she could have done is if she had it named as the trust as beneficiary, make sure that her trust had those triggers and that language to go ahead and deem her children as the beneficiaries of that IRA. And she would then be able to, or they would be able to stretch out those distributions from the $100,000 IRA over their own life expectancies. So when we have multiple beneficiaries of an IRA, we're gonna look at the life expectancy of the oldest of the members of that group. So that's gonna be John. And he's not that much older than his sister. And so he's likely to live a long time more. And so we look at those tables, we know in the end, they can get about 1.1 million out of this same IRA if they just had the right language in there. Now, I'm, again, I'm just explaining all of this because it's possible that you may have your um, trust named as the beneficiary of the IRA. But if you do, we don't even recommend doing that. We recommend that you just change it over and have your um, human beneficiaries named because it's much simpler in the end. You don't have to deal with sending trust paperwork to the IRA company and have the plan administrator approve it. It is gonna be a lot more complicated. Can you do that with the minimum required distribution of an IRA? Um, what do you mean by that? Well, they, they, they tell you you have to give so much mm -hmm. each year. Yes. You have no say in it. Yes. They're telling you. Yes. But if I made an individual person named in there to get it, Oh, you're saying can you distribute it to some other individual? I mean, you still just have to take it out while you're alive as required and pay the taxes on it. But the only way really to sort of um, avoid the tax implication there is to direct it to a charity or some other um, avenue that will save you on taxes. Because they have me with the taxes. I know. It can be a lot. And most people, it's funny, you would think you need the money, but for most people over 70 and a half, they really don't want to take the money out. They prefer to just leave it and keep it for their beneficiaries. But yeah, it's one of those things you'd want to talk to your CPA about to see if there's any way to minimize the tax there, because it is a lot. Um, defect number nine is vague or missing language. And so the first place that we often see this is when it comes to the issue of estate taxes. Now, if you have a trust that was set up a long time ago, it was pretty clear to attorneys in that time, so the 90s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, it was just thought that everyone would have a taxable estate because the level was about 600000 and when people own real estate in Hawaii, that value alone was putting your estate over that exemption. So the trust was set up in a way to account for this estate tax being due. But now it's changed, and now we're at that $11.2 million exemption. So it is a, an interesting thing that you may want to have reviewed in your own trust. So this is a married couple's trust. We call this a married joint trust. And what it says is that upon the first death, that the trust is going to split into two sub-trusts. We call it the A trust and the B trust. The A trust is a survivor's trust, and that represents a share belonging to the surviving spouse. The B trust is a family trust and it's irrevocable, which means that the surviving spouse cannot change the beneficiaries. So 
in looking at this from a Bill and Mary perspective, they set up their trust, they named their two kids as beneficiaries. When Bill died, it's split into two. Mary's got this half, she can do with it whatever she wants. She can give it away, she can spend it all. The B Trust, however, she's entitled to the income that's earned on those assets, but she can only use the principal for her own needs, her health, her education, her maintenance and support. She cannot take that money out and give it to a new spouse or some other person. So when she dies, everything would then go to the two kids. Now, most people who have this kind of split in a trust, most married couples, no longer want it in 2018. And the reason why is it's a hassle because the B trust, as I said, is irrevocable. You're restricted as to what you can do as a surviving spouse. You cannot just restart everything, put everything in one new trust because your kids are already locked in to receive one half of the estate and you need their permission to consolidate things. And you also have to do a separate tax filing for the irrevocable trust. So every year you're gonna do your income tax return, you're gonna do the separate return. And most people don't want to do that anymore because it's really not necessary because the idea of this split was to preserve both spouses' exemptions. But now that we're at 11 million, most couples do not have 22 million that they need to preserve. So instead, what we see nowadays is most couples who are under the exemption, which is pretty much everyone we deal with, will have everything flow into a survivor's trust. So just one trust being created upon that first death rather than splitting. And that makes it so that the surviving spouse has full control over the entire estate and all of the assets. And they don't have to answer to anyone. Additionally, they do not have to do any separate tax filing. And then upon the death of that surviving spouse, everything would go down to the kids. So kind of technical and I'm skipping over some of the background we would typically explain here so I understand if it's a little bit of a head scratcher but main point is you do want to make sure that if you've got an outdated trust or it's done really a long time ago you want to look at this section again or sit down with your attorney and go through it and make sure it's updated. Another place we see vague or missing language is when it comes to the issue of disability and whose funds are to be used to support a disabled spouse. And um, this isn't really right or wrong. You know, you can use both spouses' monies to pay for a disabled spouse, but in a second marriage situation, we are concerned about that. We are concerned about, are you using, mom, are you using your money to pay for your husband when he's got his own kids who should be stepping in and helping or trying to sort things out? So we do wanna make sure that's clear. I also wanna make sure that the definition of heirs is clear. So most of the time in a trust, your heirs are your blood descendants as well as any legally adopted descendants. So your children, your grandchildren who may have been adopted, etc. If you do not want to include legally adopted beneficiaries, then we have to tweak that definition a bit and make sure it matches up with your wishes. And we also know that despite best efforts of setting up a trust, sometimes there are issues and disputes that arise. Uh, between the beneficiaries and if that happens we don't want anyone to end up in court we want there to be language in there that allows them to go to mediation arbitration some other avenue that is less contentious and less expensive than going to court and we also include a no contest clause so we put those in our wills and our trust that we prepare what it says is if you're named as a beneficiary of a trust or will and you decide to contest your share you feel you're owed more than 50% of the estate or whatever it may be, then we're gonna treat you as if you were, you predeceased us. So we're gonna disinherit you, we're gonna skip over you. So this is meant there as a deterrent to discourage people from challenging trust and just stick with what it is that you're supposed to receive because you do run that risk. And most people who wanna challenge a trust are gonna go see an attorney to get an opinion and the attorney's gonna see that provision and go ahead and um, wanna discourage that. Now the last defect here is no built-in flexibility. So we think that it's important that your trust will be able to adjust to changing circumstances over the years. And you never know what those situations will be. So your language does have to be able to adapt. Now we use special co-trustees in our trust. This is known as a trust protector. This is an inv individual who can be brought in to help in the event that there is a dispute among the beneficiaries. There could also be a conflict where a trustee cannot serve and they want this third party to come in to help. 
or it could be an issue like a tax lien on a property and we're unsure how to resolve it and we want to hire a tax attorney or a real estate attorney to look at that situation. That person would come in as a special co-trustee for that specific purpose. When they're done, they step back out of the trust. So we want this person to be noted in the trust as far as the authority of a special co-trustee so that we don't end up in court fighting and have the judge make a decision. So. Um, those are our top 10 defects, so you know I went through all of them with you folks. I can always go back and show these to you again if you need to. I just want to end with explaining that although I've focused primarily on the trust, you should have various other documents as a part of a comprehensive estate plan. So when we prepare a living trust, we're also preparing a pour over will, which is connected to your trust. It is a well, last will and testament and it references your trust it's a safety net it can scoop up assets that are outside of your trust if you've got a couple bank accounts just in your name and they total less than a hundred thousand the pour over will says pour those into my trust avoid probing you also want a power of attorney so that someone can make legal decisions and financial decisions for you if you're disabled property agreement if you've got assets in community property states like California, Nevada, Texas, Washington, um, and your healthcare documents and financial planning should be in order. Power of attorney is the one where you name trustworthy agents to make those or to handle your legal and financial matters if you are unable to do so yourself. So you're alive. That's the number one key with this document. You have to be alive, but maybe you're in the hospital. Your bills need to be paid, your taxes need to be filed, and you've got your daughter named to handle those things. She can take this document, go ahead and do all those things on your behalf. If you have this, you will not end up going through a guardianship or conservatorship um, if you find yourself in that condition. And I also just wanna point out that the Advanced Healthcare Directive is very important. Now, in the past, we used to have two documents called a living will and a health care power of attorney. So this is a situation that was featured in the newspaper locally a few years ago about a woman named Karen Okada. So Mrs. Okada, in 1998, signed both of those two documents I just mentioned, the living will, the health care power of attorney. Now, one year later, Hawaii updated the document and created the advanced health care directive, so one unified document. She did not update her documents. In 2012, she was then 95 years old and she was admitted to Queens and she was on life support and feeding tubes and all of those you know, measures. And um, her nephew was named as her agent on her power of attorney, but in her living will, she said, don't give me those machines, take me off of all of those supports. But her nephew said, wait a minute, I'm her agent, I don't agree, leave them in. So they were in a battle, they ended up in court and the court eventually sided with her nephew. And they said, you know, he's our agent, he can trump what it says there. Now that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. So we just want you to know that that's a possibility if you've got those two older documents that your agent will be able to change those wishes that you've indicated. And so the key is to update. Make sure you have an advanced healthcare directive, that one document, because in that document you're naming your agents to make those decisions for you but you're also saying what those decisions are. So they do have to follow those decisions unless you indicate that they can make those decisions. So there's a box you'd be checking off saying either this is what I want or my agent can decide for me. So it's much more clear as to that issue. And it avoids your you know, unwanted medical interventions, help your family to know what your wishes are. And then the HIPAA medical privacy form is also very important. This is a privacy law and it says doctors cannot release your confidential medical information without your permission so you do want to make sure you have this document and you list the loved ones that you want to include in the circle of information so that if they go to the hospital the doctors will speak to them so your complete estate plan should have all of these documents as i mentioned so you know we like to ask that if you don't have one you take a look at getting your your situation together get all those affairs in order and you know do it now but that does conclude the presentation so i'm going to stick around here i think for the q a session but thank you everyone <laughs> i know i bet yeah he has a ton <laughs> yes well i thought if they gave me the green form at the hospital okay because i don't want to go on Okay. I don't want you bring, to bring me back to life. 
If I die once, that's enough. For yeah. Me. <laughs> so that doesn't count. When you say the green form, do you know if it's a post? The P O L S T? Yes. Okay, so that's different from this document that I was um, talking about. There are companion documents, but they address different issues. So this one is I'm on life support, you know, I'm being kept alive by machines. The one you are referring to says, My heart has stopped. Do I want to be resuscitated or do I want to be brought back? So that one should come from the doctor, which it sounds like it did, and the doctor would have reviewed it, signed off on it, and goes on your refrigerator. On my refrigerator. Okay. And it should be in the hospital record. Yes. So that should be followed. So if the paramedics respond to your home, you've got that there, and that's the situation, they'll follow that. So you can rest assured of that. Oh, because I don't want to be hooked up. Yeah. Once is enough. Yeah, but this is more like they weren't aware of it, they resuscitated you, you ended up in the hospital, you're on life support, then we're looking at this health care directive. Okay, there's another one. I was told that people can go onto the internet and if they find out they're related to me somehow, mm -hmm. somewhere, that they can uh, protest my will and my trust and put me in probate. So that's technically correct, yes. I mean, anyone who wants to challenge anything can. But I don't know how they would know about what you have. If you have a trust, then the trust is not recorded anywhere. So no one's aware of what it says. They're not aware of who gets what. And so from that standpoint, I don't imagine any distant relatives would you know, come out of the woodwork because you wouldn't be publishing a notice in the newspaper. But if you end up in probate, that's when that notice gets published. That's when people will see your name and then want to make claims. But if you have a trust and they see your obituary, I don't know who they're going to call to challenge because your estate's not going through court. It's just going through paperwork and transferring it to your beneficiaries. Because I had some people all of a sudden came out of the closet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't even know them. Yeah, it happens. You think you're dead? Well, sometimes I don't have to wear it. I have to put makeup on. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? I have a solution for you. Go to Vegas and spend it all. Yeah. We're in Vegas. Go to Vegas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, our Pacific plan is like 25 plus years old. Mm. And the kids are preteen. Yes. Okay. And the provision that trusts us, once they turn 30, they get everything. Mm-hmm. Right Yes. All the trustees we had named are gone. Mm -hmm. So when we do a new one, which we're working on now, mm -hmm. what, how do we handle making the old documents obsolete? Or yeah, it depends. On, it's hard for me to give a general answer to that, but it depends on what the attorney is recommending. If you've already funded the trust, you have your property in there, so your bank accounts. Okay. So when I come across people in that situation, we either decide to amend and restate the existing document, so you keep the same document, and normally we do that when you already have funded it and you've got a lot of assets transferred to that trust, then you don't want to go through the hassle of starting all over. But if you do not have anything in there, then you could just do a new trust. You could revoke the old trust, say I no longer want that to apply, and just keep that revocation with the new so trust this documents. Is to the fact that this document, the new trust document, supersedes any Yes, previous. yes. But it's not really necessary to have a revocation done, especially if the old trust doesn't hold any assets, because then it's not going to control anything anyway. If you've unfunded it and everything's out of there, it's yeah, pretty much the dead. The, the the yeah. But if it makes you feel better, we do have clients who want to do a revocation, so we do the new trust and then we revoke the old one. Yeah. Yes? Um, what value of the state do you think is a tipping point to make, for someone to make a trust? Of course, not, probably not 10,000, maybe would. Mm -hmm. um, 100,000, yeah. 100,000, Good half question. a million, a million? Um, the, the two considerations I would say, number one, do you own real estate? If you own real estate, you should have a trust. Um, and that even applies to people on the Big Island who have properties that are not so valuable, but it's still going to require probate upon their death. So real estate ownership. 
Um, the other consideration would be if you have more than $100,000 in assets that do not have a beneficiary or co-owner on them. Like a, bank. a bank account or stocks, bonds, mutual funds, all those sorts of things. Then you could benefit from having a trust and avoiding probate on those assets because the probate threshold is 100000 in this state. So if you've got more than 100000 in your individual name and you die, you have to go through probate. Life insurance policies that name the trusted beneficiary mm -hmm. and just change the beneficiary. Just yes. So you just want to make sure you update that to the new trust. I got to do that probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once you sign the new trust, then you contact them. I mean, no, I mean, it's, <coughs> at the present time, it's still, like, if I remember correctly, the, the trustee, the trust lady is the beneficiary mm -hmm. for the life insurance mm -hmm. policy. So That's it's okay. Changed, yeah. But, it's but the, the current trust is not funded with anything else. But yeah, but so are you going to put your property in there in the current in the new trust? In the new trust, okay. So then I could, in the time until we get the new trust, mm -hmm. get rid of whatever. Mm -hmm. The concern I had is right now, I think the insurance policies shows the beneficiary mm -hmm. and the trustee. I haven't looked at it for so long. Those you call it the life insurance trust or something. Mm -hmm. like that? Oh, so you have an irrevocable life insurance trust. I don't you have think a, it's an irrevocable oh. insurance. Yeah. Okay, I think I think as as uh, as the policy owner, you can always change the. You can always, you change, can always the change the beneficiary. Yeah, yeah we so recommend naming the trust as beneficiary. Okay. But when you mention a life insurance trust, it may be there is something called a islet, which oh. is a a life insurance yeah, trust. So. Yeah, you just want to check on that. Yeah. Yes. See, I put a property into a trust. Mm -hmm. Then I decide uh, next year I want to sell it. Mm -hmm. Is that hard? No. Oh, well, I, the realtors can speak to yeah, it. I'm sure they'd I, prefer I for it. Is, is, is the tr can I sell it? You can. Trust? You okay. can. You're the trustee of the trust. You can sell it. Yeah. I think there's a little more, um, there's some s additional steps maybe where it's easier if it's not in the trust, but people sell directly from a trust all the time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, you folks. Ahead.